Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you this book about Algeria. Let's just dive right in. Algeria. We're going to read The Land, Algeria's History, Government and Foreign Relations, The Economy, Culture and People, Cities and Communities, maybe we'll read the calendar of Algerian festivals, and I believe that's it. Here we go. Chapter 1, The Land. I'll let you look at the picture while I read. Africa is a huge continent, the second largest on Earth after Asia. Sprawling across its northwestern Sahara region is a big country, the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria. It is the second largest country in Africa after Sudan. Well, not anymore. Now it is the largest country in Africa. And is about a third as large as the continental United States. Although Algeria borders the Mediterranean Sea, it is a land that is seriously poor in water. Algeria has few rivers and freshwater lakes. Most of the country is desert, where only a few thousand hardy people live. However, along its northern coastline, between the ocean and highlands, is a pleasant, long-settled region that has had a strong impact on history. Algeria dominates the southern Mediterranean just inside the Strait of Gibraltar, the Mediterranean's western entrance. This makes Algiers the nation's capital a major port of call for vessels sailing between the open Atlantic and the Gulf of Suez at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Maghreb, a fertile zone between desert and sea. The Atlas Mountains sweep across northwestern Africa parallel to the Mediterranean shoreline from Tunisia in the east to the Atlantic coast of Morocco in the west. The mountains and the coastal plain leading to the sea are known as the Maghreb region of Africa. This stretch of Mediterranean Africa has also been called the Barbary Coast. During the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, sailors dreaded the area because of the notorious Barbary pirates who were based there. At different times in recent history, some of the political leaders of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia have sought to form a united Maghreb, or at least establish cooperation among the three neighboring countries. Boundary disputes and other complications have prevented this from happening. Still, the Maghreb binds the inhabitants of northwestern Africa together in important ways. Many researchers who have studied the history, culture, and geology of this part of the world have focused on the Maghreb as a whole, not on any one country. The northern part of Algeria along the coast known as the Tell region, has a mild Mediterranean climate with adequate rainfall to support agriculture. Late autumn and winter are its rainy seasons. French settlers who occupied the territory between the 1830s cultivated impressive orchards and vineyards. Today, the Tell remains Algeria's farming region. Oaks, pines, and cedars are the most common trees in this area. Brushwood and grass grow on the plateaus. Naturally, it is the part of the country where most people live. In northeastern Algeria lie two smaller mountain ranges that are separate from the main Atlas chain. The historic city of Constantine is situated in the low-lying Petit Kabyle Mountains near the coast. During the 19th and 20th centuries, French colonists found these highlands especially suitable for growing grains. Located a bit farther so south, the Alres Mountains are rugged and forbidding. For centuries, Berber rebels and refugees have taken to the Alres for shelter from invading armies and authorities. The Sahara Desert To the south of Algeria's long east-west mountain ranges, the Great Sahara Desert covers a broad swath of northern Africa, from Egypt in the east to Morocco in the west. Most of Algeria is covered by this immense desert. 
The name Sahara conjures scenes of vast, windswept sand dunes. This indeed is a major part of the picture. But the desert also has areas of gravel, rocks, and hills. In the Tassili and Najer Highlands, there are strange stone formations, petrified sand dunes that resemble castles. Not far away, plateaus formed of sandstone are marked by rough gorges, the work of rivers that ran dry thousands of years ago. In other areas, the Sahara is like a pebble-strewn carpet, and at places, especially in the northern half of the desert, there are oases, surprising havens of greenery and water amid barren surroundings. The desert is basically hot and dry. The Sahara receives less than five inches of rainfall a year. A sandy desert wind called the Sirocco often blows northward and invades the inhabited areas of the Tell in the summer months. But while the Sahara is lightly populated and harsh, it is vital to Algeria's economy. In the desert of eastern Algeria lies much of the country's mineral wealth, including natural gas and petroleum. Today, a north-south highway through the Sahara Desert connects Algiers with Lagos, the largest city in Nigeria, far to the south. Algerian Wildlife The only bird found exclusively in Algeria is the Algerian nuthatch. It is a small songbird with a big head short tail, and powerful beak that are characteristic of all nut hatches. Only discovered in 1973, the Algerian nut hatch lives in four areas of mountain forest in the northeastern part of the country. Additionally, it only lives in places above an elevation of 3,300 feet. The Algerian nut hatch is blue-gray with a buff-colored belly. The male has a black crown and eye stripe while the female has a gray crown and eye stripe. There are less than 4,000 of these birds in existence, so they are listed as officially endangered. Logging and fires are the greatest threats to their habitat. Another endangered bird of the Maghreb is the Waldrap, or northern bald ibis. The bird has black glossy feathers, a bald red head, and a red bill. It makes its home in the rocky desert where it feeds on insects and rodents. There are estimated to be 420 wall traps left in the wild. Their decline is linked to loss of habitat, hunting, and poisoning from pesticides. Conservation groups have been breeding the birds in captivity in the hopes of being able to reintroduce some into the wild. Although they are now only found in the Moroccan portion of the Maghreb, their range used to cover all of North Africa. Also unique to the Maghreb are Barbary macaques. Sometimes called Barbary apes, these primates are actually monkeys. They inhabit the oak and cedar forests of the north of Algeria, and a small band lives in Gibraltar, making them the only primate in Europe other than humans. The macaques have long fur that ranges in color from yellow-gray to gray-brown. They have dark-colored faces and no tails. Macaques are mostly herbivores, eating leaves, roots, and fruit, but they will also eat insects. Barbary macaques live in mixed gender groups of 10 to 13 members headed by a dominant female. Male Barbary macaques are active participants in raising the young. They will play with them and groom them, which is a unique behavior among the macaque species. When choosing mates, female macaques seem to prefer those males with good parental skills. Barbary macaques bear one offspring per mating season. Twins are very uncommon. Due to logging and local farmers, the macaques in the Maghreb are endangered. Although the Moroccan macaque population ranges from 6,000 to 10,000, there are only 1,200 to 2,000 left in Algeria and another 200 to 300 in Gibraltar. Another inhabitant of Algeria is the sand cat. These creatures live in the sand dunes of the Sahara, and their tan coats blend well into that environment. They have a broad head with large, close-set eyes. Their ears are large to make it easier to find scarce prey. The dunes muffle sound quite well, so the sand cat needs extra sensitive hearing in order to find food. 
Another one of their desert adaptations is the long hairs which cover the pads of their feet. These create cushions which insulate them from the hot sand. They also make it easier to move silently over the loose terrain. Sand cats are expert diggers. They dig burrows to live in and dig rodents out of the sand for food. Because of this, their claws are not particularly sharp. Sand cats will eat whatever they can find, such as gerbils, sand voles, reptiles, and insects. These cats are also known to be particularly adept snake hunters. They will stun a snake with rapid blows to the head before biting its neck for the kill. It is believed that the cat originally domesticated by the Egyptians was a sand cat. Given their ability to hunt rodents and kill snakes, these small cats would have been a blessing to any town that they wandered near. It is thought that grateful humans began to leave food out for the cats as a way to thank them for taking care of pests. Among the pests that the sand cats would have hunted is the sand viper. These pale snakes have three rows of brown spots that run the length of their bodies. They bury themselves in the sand during the day and emerge at night to eat. Sand vipers are cantankerous and quick to strike. Their venom is hemotoxic. This means that it destroys red blood cells, keeps blood from clotting, and destroys organs. Permanent damage is common, even if anti-venom is applied quickly. Not always desert. Scientists believe that in prehistoric times, the Sahara was not the desert it is today, but was instead a fertile, grassy region called a savanna. Cave art discovered in the southeastern mountains of Ahagar and Tassilia Najer, estimated to be as old as 8,000 years, tells of a people that once thrived in what is now the hot, dry Sahara. Scientists believe that the people who made these paintings were hunters of the Neolithic Age. At the time, the region was alive with the kinds of animals that still are common to other parts of Africa, such as rhinoceroses, elephants, hippopotamuses, lions, and buffaloes. Today, of course, that is quite changed. The bleak plateaus of the Ahagar Highlands have been compared to the surface of the moon. Even in the region north of the Atlas Mountains, forest land has been lost to the spread of civilization in recent generations. Algeria, to most foreigners, is simply one of several vast countries devoured by the Sahara, appealing to few but the most adventurous outsiders. However, it is unique among its neighbors. Its particular combination of people, cultures, politics, problems, and historical development is found in no other country. Algeria's history. Let's take a look at this picture. The fertile coastal plain of what is now Algeria has been inhabited and controlled by many different peoples. The indigenous inhabitants of North Africa are collectively known as the Berbers. I'll let you see the page. Tribes of nomads whose origin is not clearly understood. Their society was not highly organized, making them vulnerable to outsiders. About 4,000 years ago, the seafaring Phoenicians began to establish coastal trading settlements along the coast of North Africa. One of the most important Phoenician cities was Carthage in modern-day Tunisia. The city was founded in the 9th century BCE and eventually became a wealthy trading center and a powerful military kingdom. By the 6th century BCE, other Phoenician colonies of North Africa were under its influence. In a series of struggles for control in the Mediterranean world, Carthage found itself repeatedly at war. It fought the Greeks in the 4th century BCE. In the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, it conducted a series of lengthy campaigns against the city-state of Rome, known as the Punic Wars. During the Punic Wars, much of the area of modern-day Algeria was called Numidia. Not all the city kings in Numidia supported Carthage. One Numidian king, Masinissa, helped the Romans win a decisive battle over the Carthaginians in 202 BCE. The Romans rewarded Masinissa by giving him authority over all Numidia. 
he made his capital at Sirta, which today is the city of Constantine. Between 149 and 146 BCE, Roman forces destroyed Carthage. Eventually, Rome took over Numidia and other parts of North Africa as well. The Roman Empire ruled Northern Africa for more than 500 years. However, the empire gradually weakened and was eventually overrun by barbarian forces. In the year 429 CE, a tribe of people called the Vandals crossed into Northern Africa from Spain. The Vandals captured Carthage, ending Roman control in this part of the Maghreb. The coming of the Arabs. During the 7th and 8th century CE, Arabs from the Middle East invaded and conquered the Berber lands of northwestern Africa. Although the inhabitants resisted, over time the Arab Muslims and Berbers intermarried and blended their customs and traditions. The Islamic religion and the Arabic language became dominant. Europeans came to call these inhabitants of North Africa the Moors. During the 8th century, the Moors crossed the Mediterranean and invaded the Iberian Peninsula, conquering modern-day Spain and Portugal, and establishing an Islamic kingdom there. Moorish cities like Andalusia, Toledo, and Granada became centers for learning and culture in medieval Europe. But between the 11th and 15th centuries, European Christians living in what today is Spain began a gradual reconquest of the European territory, and the Moors retreated to North Africa. Soon after the last of the Moors left Spain in 1492, the Ottoman Turks began invading and conquering the Maghreb. The Turks built an empire throughout the Middle East and North Africa from their power base in what is today Turkey. The Berbers could not hold them back, for they had no unified government or army. The Berbers had only wandering tribes, some stronger than others, and a variety of villages, some larger than others. However, some Berber corsairs tried to resist the Ottomans and also fight the Spanish Christians for their coastal strongholds. Spanish commerce, in particular, suffered at the hands of the corsairs, so Spain established a fort at Peñón, an island in the Bay of Algiers. The angry emir, or ruler of Algiers, pleaded with the corsairs to oust the Europeans from Peñón. Khair Adin Barbarossa and his brother Arouge responded by assassinating the emir and installing themselves as rulers. Arouge was killed in a battle with the Spaniards in 1518. But in 1529, Barbarossa drove the Spaniards from Peñón. He then claimed the territory for the Ottoman Empire and was made an admiral in their fleet. He made Algiers a base for the notorious Barbary pirates of the lower Mediterranean coast. The Turks and their pirate allies would dominate the Maghreb for the next three centuries. Wealthy Ottomans supported the Barbary corsairs, supplying them with ships. In return, the backers received a percentage of the goods and treasures the pirates captured at sea. Over the years, the corsairs took tens of thousands of prisoners, holding them in horrible conditions and forcing governments and families to pay money to have them freed. The leaders of the Barbary states, Algeria, Tripoli, Morocco, and Tunisia, demanded tributes from foreign governments to ensure safe passage for their ships. The raids of the Barbary pirates led to conflicts with many European governments and, during the early 1800s, with the newly independent United States. But it would fall to the French to finally end the Barbary pirates' dreaded reign in northern Africa. In 1827, France dispatched forces to Algiers to blockade the port and stop the Barbary pirates. The French Era during the 19th century, European nations began jockeying for control over the African continent. In 1830, France officially declared Algeria its territory. To lure colonists to Algeria, the French government made an attractive offer. It would give European immigrants to Algeria free land, livestock, and seeds for planting crops. It would even ship them across the Mediterranean to their new homes at no cost. The strategy was effective. 
by 1875, almost 300,000 Europeans were living in Algeria, approximately one-tenth of the country's population. By 1911, the Europeans numbered 752,000. Europeans in Algeria during the colonial period were known as colons or pieds noirs, or black feet, a name probably given to them because French soldiers wore black shoes. Algerian natives were called indigènes. Although France controlled the country, an estimated 80% of Europeans living in Algeria by the 1900s were from other countries, particularly Spain and Italy. In certain towns and neighborhoods, more residents spoke Spanish than French. The Europeans took over the best farmland, displacing native Algerians. Indigens were taxed heavily, but received few benefits from the colonial government in return. The French colonial administration required Muslims in Algeria to carry passes and obtain government permission before they were allowed to travel. A Bloody Road to Independence The unfair practices and policies of the French rules of Algeria led to various uprisings and independence movements. Indigen uprisings began as early as 1871, but were put down harshly by the French. Discontent grew more intense as the growing Muslim population fell deeper and deeper into poverty. Deprived of good farmland and unable to get factory jobs, they seethed at their French overlords. After the end of World War II in 1945, the movement for Algerian independence gained strength, breaking into a bloody rebellion by 1954. By 1916, estimated 300,000 French soldiers, joined by 150,000 Muslim volunteers, were at war against an estimated 50,000 guerrilla fighters of the Front de Libération Nationale, or FLN. The FLN was a Muslim organization determined to drive out the French. The colonial administration's soldiers were more numerous and better armed, so FLN guerrillas resorted to terrorist attacks against civilians. They ambushed buses and concealed time bombs in restaurants and stores, for example. It was a brutal way to fight the war for independence, especially since FLN attacks killed nine times as many Algerian Muslims as French soldiers. In the end, it is estimated that a million Algerians, one-tenth of the population, died as a result of the eight-year struggle. As the war dragged on, the French found themselves in an impossible situation. The French government tried in vain to win the allegiance of poor Muslim villagers by improving their living conditions. Soldiers constructed huts and water systems and provided basic supplies. Volunteer nurses and teachers from France went out to remote mountain villages to help. The rebels responded by destroying the new utility works, putting landmines on railroad tracks, and ambushing buses and relief convoys. French soldiers had to accompany travelers while fighter planes scouted the road ahead to look for signs of guerrilla units. The people of France eventually forced the government to end its increasingly unpopular fight to keep control of Algeria. In 1962, the French military withdrew from Algeria and many Europeans fled the country. Revolutionaries executed other Algerians suspected of supporting the French. It was a frightful time. Arab Berbers and Europeans alike wondered what would become of Algeria. Independent Algeria Ahmed bin Bella, a leader of the militant revolutionaries, emerged as independent Algeria's first premier. By having rival leaders arrested or forced into exile, Ben Bella set himself up as Algeria's undisputed ruler. However, he was brought down just three years later in a bloodless coup, led by a trusted military commander, Colonel Huari Boumedien. Boumedien then served as president of Algeria until his death in 1978. Boumedien had instituted socialist reforms in Algeria, redistributing farmland to peasants. Under his rule, the country was largely controlled by the military. Boumedien was succeeded by another army officer, Colonel Chadli Benjadid. Independence brought an end to the long, bloody revolution. 
but it did not bring an end to unrest in Algeria. The FLN was the only political party allowed to participate in Algeria's government, and this angered some people. In 1988, after a series of violent protests, President Benjadid permitted changes to Algeria's constitution that allowed new political parties to form. In 1990 and 1991, a party called the Front Islamique du Salut, or the Islamic Salvation Front, or FIS, received strong support in local and national elections. Leaders of the FIS were Islamic fundamentalists or Islamists. One of their goals was to make Islamic religious laws and teachings the basis for Algeria's government. Leaders of the military were afraid the FIS would gain control of the National Assembly, which could enable the party to carry out its plan to make Algeria a theocracy. To prevent this from happening, the military forced Benjadid to resign and cancelled elections for the assembly that had been scheduled for 1992. The new military-backed government declared a state of emergency in Algeria, giving it authority to sharply curtail people's freedom in the name of national security. Civil War in Algeria The cancellation of the election sparked a civil war. Members of the FIS formed a resistance force, the Islamic Salvation Army. Two other guerrilla groups, the Armed Islamic Group, or the GIA, and the Islamic Armed Movement, or the MIA, also formed at this time. The GIA was based in towns, while the MIA fought in the outlying mountain regions. They initially focused their attacks on the army and military installations, but soon moved on to attacking civilian targets. In 1994, the Algerian government made some progress in negotiating with the FIS, but this angered the GIA. The MIA joined the FIS to form the Islamic Salvation Army, or AIS, and both went to war against the GIA, which soon began a campaign targeting entire villages. The first of the three sides to give in was the Islamic Salvation Army, which asked the government for a ceasefire. In 1997, the GIA eventually fell apart over internal disagreements about its policy of massacring civilians. After Algeria held elections in 1999, newly elected President Abdelaziz Bouteflika's government granted amnesty to the militants who had not committed serious crimes. The Islamic Salvation Army was dissolved, although remnants of the GIA continued to be a problem into the new century. Overall, more than 150,000 Algerians are believed to have been killed during the civil war. Terrorism remains a considerable threat in Algeria, but instances of large-scale violence are much less common. One group still actively fighting is the Salafist Group for Preaching and Combat, or the GSPC, an organization that broke away from the GIA in 1998. In January 2007, the group changed its name to the Al-Qaeda Organization in the Islamic Maghreb, reflecting its links to the international terrorist organization founded by Osama bin Laden. This group launched numerous attacks throughout 2007 and 2008, including the car bombing of a UN building that killed dozens of people. In April 2010, Algeria, Mauritania, Mali, and Nigeria responded by officially joining forces to combat terrorism. Arab Spring Protests On December 18, 2010, in neighboring Tunisia, a fruit vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi committed suicide by lighting himself on fire to protest police corruption and bad treatment. This incident touched off a wave of protests against the Tunisian government, which forced the Tunisian president Zine al Abidin Ben Ali to flee the country in mid January. Protests soon erupted in other Arab countries, including Algeria, where the first demonstrations occurred on December 28, 2010. The Algerian protesters were angry about high unemployment, particularly among young people, as well as high food prices, government corruption, and restrictions on freedom. The Algerians generally used civil disobedience techniques, 
mounting sustained campaigns involving strikes, demonstrations, marches, and rallies. In some cases, though, protesters threw stones or Molotov cocktails at Algerian police, attempting to disperse the demonstrators. As in other countries, events are often coordinated through social media sites such as Facebook and Twitter. The Bouteflika government attempted to suppress the protests, sometimes through violent means, but this proved impossible. In February, due to continuing public pressure, the government lifted the 19-year-old state of emergency decree, ending many restrictions. On April 15th, President Bouteflika spoke on Algerian television, promising to seek constitutional amendments that would provide greater democracy and broader freedom for the media and for political parties. Despite these assurances, protests against the government continued to occur in Algeria. Government and Foreign Relations After gaining independence, Algeria established a socialist state under the Ahmad bin Bella administration. The socialist form of government is patterned after that of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, the government took control over all industry in the hopes of raising efficiency in all sectors. Farms were seized from those who owned them and changed into collective farms. Collective farms were larger than individual farms and could therefore be worked using modern tractors instead of horses and plows. The goal was to increase food production and thereby raise the economic prospects of the entire country. Originally, socialism seemed necessary for the new Algeria. After French business people and public officials departed the country, factories were left deserted and unemployment soared. The government hoped its intervention could stabilize the economy. However, socialism was not a tremendous success in Algeria. Agriculture, for example, was less productive because the cooperative farms had inefficient and incompetent management. The country was not raised out of its economic depression like its leaders had hoped. To fight poverty, the Algerian market has since moved toward a Western-style setup with the privatization of many formerly government-owned industries. The FLN was Algeria's only political party during the first decades of independence. A November 1988 amendment to the constitution enabled Algeria to become a multi-party democracy and end, ended the commitment to socialism. The Ministry of the Interior officially approves all new political parties. To date, there have been more than 40. The Executive Branch Presidential elections are held every five years, and all citizens aged 18 and over are eligible to vote. Once elected, the president appoints a prime minister, who then appoints a cabinet of other officials to oversee different areas of government. The president is responsible for national defense and dealing with foreign policy. He's the commander of the armed forces and appoints his generals. The president also appoints the president of the state council, the magistrates, the governor of the central bank, and provincial governors. The president has the right to decree laws in the state of emergency or state of war. The, the president at the time this book came out of Algeria is Abdelaziz Bouteflika. He's no longer been president since 2019, but anyway. He was elected in 1999, having been the preferred candidate of the Algerian military. He was also the only candidate, as complaints about fraud caused all other candidates to withdraw from the election in protest. With Bouteflika's first election was under, wow, Bouteflika's first election was under dubious circumstances. His re-election in 2004 was hailed as a model for the democratic process. Bouteflika's economic policies in his first term were successful enough to earn him re-election against five other opponents. Although Algeria's constitution originally limited the president to two five-year terms, the, in 2008, the constitution was amended to allow unlimited terms. Bouteflika was elected easily to a third term in 2009, receiving over 90% of the vote. However, this time international observers of the electoral process in Algeria noted that the election was not fairly contested. 
the Bouteflika government largely controlled the election process, including which candidates would run in opposition. As a result, many Algerians declined to participate in the elections, believing them to be a sham. Although official figures said that more than 74% of Algerians voted, other sources found that a voter participation level might have been as low as 16%. The Legislative Branch just like the United States Congress, Algeria's legislature is divided into an upper and a lower house. The lower house is the National People's Assembly, consisting of 389 representatives who are elected to five-year terms. The legislature meets for two sessions a year, each lasting at least four months. In 2012, only an estimated 30% of eligible voters cast ballots in the election, for the National People's Assembly election, suggesting that a large number of Algerians felt disillusioned when it comes to politics. The upper legislative body, the Council of Nations, consists of 144 members. Two-thirds of them are elected. The others are appointed by the president. Council members serve six-year terms in office. For purposes of local administration, Algeria is divided into 48 provinces called Wilayas governed by regional officials. The current arrangement of the wilayas has not changed since 1983, although the divisions have been altered more than once since independence. The legislature passes laws pertaining to rights and duties of individuals, personal status and family law, nationality and immigration, the judicial branch, branch and its jurisdiction, criminal law, finance, public health, labor, defense, and international relations. The People's Assembly approves laws by majority, while the Council of Nations must approve by a three-fourths vote. The Judicial Branch The Supreme Judicial Council oversees the nomination of judges and functioning of the courts. The first-level courts are called daira. These courts are presided over by a single judge. Civil, commercial, and minor criminal cases are heard in this lower-level tribunal. Above the daira are provincial courts. Three judges preside over these mid-level courts, which are split into civil, criminal, administrative, and accusation. Appeals from the daira are heard in provincial courts. The Supreme Court has a chamber for private law covering civil and commercial cases, social law, hearing social security and labor cases, criminal law, and administration. In the cities of Oran, Constantine, and Algiers, there are courts that deal with economic crimes against the state. The Constitutional Council, established in 1989, determines the constitutionality of law, much like the Supreme Court of the United States. International Relations since independence, Algerian leaders have been wary of forming close alliances with other countries. During the Cold War, for example, Algeria was among the leaders of the Non-Aligned Movement, a group of countries that refused to side with either the United States or the Soviet Union. However, Algeria has joined several organizations that reflect the country's support of Arab and African unity. In 1989, Algerian leaders helped form the Union of the Arab Maghreb, a group of northwest African coastal nations seeking to improve economic and trade policies in the region. Algeria is also a member of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, a coalition of mostly Arab na nations with significant oil resources. The Arab League, an organization that includes all of the countries in the Arab world, the African Union, a group interested in promoting economic success in Africa and unity among African nations, and the Organization of the Islamic Conference, designed to improve international relations between predominantly Muslim states. When neighboring North African nations Ethiopia and Eritrea attempted to settle a vicious border dispute, Algeria worked with other countries to aid the 2000 peace process. The relationship between the United States and Algeria was shaky for many years. In 1962, when Algeria became independent, the U.S. was not only allied with France, but was also in the midst of the Cold War. American leaders were not sure what to make of the socialist Algerian government. However, the situation has changed. 
In July 2001, President Putzaflika visited the White House, the first Algerian president to do so in 15 years. In recent years, Algeria and the United States have agreed to work together to fight international terrorism. Historically, Algeria has supported the Palestine Liberation Organization in its long dispute with Israel over control of territory in the Jordan River region. However, in recent years, Algerian leaders have expressed hope for a peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Algeria is on fairly stable terms with most of its geographic neighbors, with the notable exception of Morocco. It violently disputed its northwestern boundary with Morocco after independence. After years of combat and tension, the two countries agreed in 1972 on a borderline of almost a thousand miles. But three years later, tensions led to the closing of part of the border, a situation that lasted until 1983. Conflict also arose in 1976 when the Sarari Polisario Front, a rebel group in the Moroccan Western Sahara Territory, began fighting Morocco for independence. The Moroccan government was not pleased when Algeria announced its support for the Polisario independence movement. Although interaction between Morocco and Algeria remains icy, with each country accusing the other of harboring militant activity and smuggling arms, positive development occurred in 2004 when Morocco lifted visa requirements on Algerian citizens. Just as illegal aliens from poorer countries enter the United States, illegal aliens from the Maghreb have sought better lives in Europe. An estimated 5 million people of Algerian descent live in France today, and there are significant Algerian immigrant populations in Spain, Italy, and Germany as well chapters about the economy. If that last chapter didn't put you to sleep, this one just might. When Algeria gained independence in 1962, the native Arab Berber population did not suddenly become prosperous. Algeria's economy was in bad shape after eight years of civil war, and when the French withdrew, some 800,000 European residents fled the country. Since they included most of the skilled labor force, as well as doctors, teachers, experienced administrators, and other professionals, Algeria was left in disarray. Factories were shut down. Farms could produce little. For a while, more than two-thirds of the new nation's population were out of work. In the 1970s, the country began to recover, thanks to valuable resources that had lain hidden in the ground beneath Algeria oil, natural gas, and minerals. Algeria's Important Natural Resources Fuel sources, like hydrocarbons, are Algeria's most valuable economic assets. Sales of natural gas and oil to world markets have made Algeria fairly prosperous compared to other African countries. They account for more than half of the country's national income. Oil was discovered in the Algerian desert in 1956 and began to be exported five years later. Algeria's estimated oil reserves make it the world's 16th most oil-rich nation. Natural gas is an important asset as well, as Algeria has the 10th largest gas reserve in the world. Other mineral exports are less significant but make an important contribution to Algeria's economy. These include iron ore, phosphates, zinc, and mercury. Agriculture is a less lucrative part of the nation's economy, in part because farming is limited by the desert terrain and confined to the northernmost part of the country. Less than 4% of the land in Algeria can be farmed. On it, Algerians grow barley, wheat, and other grains, citrus, grapes, and other fruits, and a variety of vegetables. They raise cows, sheep, and other livestock, but have to import much of their animal feed from other countries. On the coast, fishermen take their living from the ageless Mediterranean. Algeria's fishing industry is not well developed, however. Overall, the country's farm and fishing production is not enough to meet everyone's food needs, so the government is forced to import other edibles from abroad. What little farmland exists has been abused. Since Algeria has so little grazing land, livestock owners tend to overgraze the pastures. 
This results in soil erosion, which makes the land less able to produce in the next growing season. Another form of damage caused by unsound farming practices is the polluting runoff of fertilizer from fields and orchards. It drains into streams, rivers, and ultimately the Mediterranean Sea. This has threatened Algeria's delicate supply of adequate drinking water for its people. Living Standards In many ways, Algerians are better off than many people in other parts of Africa and the Middle East. They receive free education and basic medical care. But many Algerians also live in poverty and struggle to endure the hardships caused by unemployment and inadequate housing. Housing has been a problem in the country since independence. When the Europeans left, their empty houses were taken over by squatters. And while this provided shelter to some Algerians moving to the city, it was not enough. The Algerian government halted all new construction in the cities to try to stem the tide of migrants, but this simply resulted in shanty towns called bidonvilles, with some of the highest occupancy rates in the world, an average of 7.5 people per house. Algeria is currently short 1.5 million houses, even after massive construction projects throughout the, the 1990s. To combat this, in 2006, the government announced plans to build 1 million new units with the help of UN Habitat, a UN initiative to reduce slums around the world and replace them with sustainable housing. Infrastructure While many American households have more than one telephone line, in Algeria, there is one telephone for every 20 people, on average. There is one radio for perhaps every four people, and fewer than half as many television sets. In 2007, it was estimated that less than 2 million people out of a population of more than 32 million were internet users. While technologically poor, Algeria is fairly well connected when it comes to transportation. Several major east-west highways run through northern Algeria, between the Moroccan and Tunisian borders, as does a rail line. Shorter roads connect towns and cities, and the larger cities are linked by rail as well. Most primitive roadways extend through the desert toward the neighboring countries to the south. In all, about 67,300 miles of highways crisscross the country. About two-thirds of the roads are paved, the rest are gravel or simply packed earth. The country has approximately 2,470 miles of railroads, used mainly for transporting cargo. And it has more than 140 airports and airstrips, although fewer than half of them have paved tarmacs. International airports serve Algiers and several other large cities. Prosperity and Problems As a nation, Algeria has fared better than most African states that became independent during the mid-20th century. It earns about twice as much money selling fuel and other products to foreign countries as it spends buying food and other goods from abroad. Algeria faces difficult economic challenges, however. Most disturbing is its dependence on petroleum and natural gas for so much of its national income. Oil and gas reserves cannot last forever. In time, they will be gone and even while they exist, their prices rise and fall as a result of worldwide factories beyond Algeria's control. When the price of raw fuels goes up, fuel-producing nations such as Algeria reap heady profits in the global market. When they drop, the government might, must tighten its budget, which can be difficult. The country also suffers from high unemployment. As of 2011, Algeria's labor force was about 9.9 .9 million workers, According to official government figures, one out of ten Algerians is unemployed. The government may be understating the unemployment figures, however, as it is particularly hard for young Algerians to find jobs. According to some experts, the unemployment rate among Algerians under the age of 30 may be, may be as high as 75%, one of the key issues fueling the anti-government protests that broke out in January 2011 and continued regularly throughout that year. The nation's leaders recognized the need to find new ways to support the oil-based economy, but this is no easy task in a land that is mostly desert. Culture and people. 
the people of Algeria and other Maghreb countries are predominantly a mixture of Arabs and Berbers. Arabs began migrating across northern Africa during the mid-600s. They dominated the territory and intermarried with the native Berbers. It has been estimated that about 80% of Algerians today are Arabs, while 20% are Berbers. However, it can be a difficult task to distinguish between Arabs and Berbers when discussing the people of Algeria. Since the 1960s, the government census has not specified Berbers as a separate category of the population. Many Algerians who consider themselves Arabs have both Arab and Berber ancestors. Berbers and Arabs still clash over issues of cultural identity, language, and representation in the government. Since Arabs and Berbers are often racially indistinguishable, they have come to identify themselves based on the language they speak. The Berber language, Tamazight, is not an official language in Algeria, despite being spoken by 15-30% to 30 of the population. The Arabization of Algeria has left the Berbers a marginalized people who do not feel that their culture is respected or represented in their own country. The government even went so far as to create a list of approved names for children, a list that did not contain popular Berber names. Despite both groups following Islam, Berbers feel that some Muslim leaders consider themselves consider them insufficiently Muslim because they do not speak Arabic. This tension will sometimes break out in rioting, but by and large, Algeria has been relatively free of that kind of ethnic violence that has been catastrophic in other African nations. Arab Berber skirmishes and riots are on a much smaller scale than the kind of ethnic violence seen elsewhere. Berbers have tried to use diplomacy rather than violence to solve their problems, and in 2002 the government finally made a concession to their demands, declaring Tamazight a national language, though not an official language. It was a step that many were happy to see, although it didn't, does not solve the tension. The Berbers, Algeria's original inhabitants. The term Berber comes from the Latin word barbara, barbarians but a Berber inhabited northern Africa many centuries before the Roman period. Early Berbers had diverse culture with physical differences among the tribes. Today, after many centuries of contact and intermarriage with various peoples who conquered and settled the region, the most common characteristics of Berbers is their language. Apart from the dominant Arab Berber population, Four major separate groups of Berbers in Algeria are descended from the early inhabitants. Each group speaks a dialect of its own. The largest group of Berbers in Algeria is the Kabyles, who live atop the mountains near the coastline east of Algiers. Historically regarded as clannish and independent-minded, the Kabyles followed the authority of their own village councils, the Jama'a. Kabyles are famous in Algerian history for their series of revolts against the French administration during the late 1800s. Today, the Jama'a continue to be a source for leadership, even though Algerian government has established civil administrations. The Chawia inhabit the Ores Mountains in eastern Algeria. Where possible, Chawia grow grain and cultivate orchards. In less farmable areas, they herd livestock from pasture to pasture, following the seasons in a quest for adequate grazing. Nomadic Tuareg Berbers, also known as the Blue People, live in the southeastern highlands of the Algerian desert. They are called the Blue People because they grind indigo stones into a fine powder in order to dye their clothes. This powder rubs off on their skin, and the effect is considered quite beautiful. The Tuareg divide themselves into a class system. They have their own form of nobility and, at the opposite extreme, servants and slaves. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Tuareg is that, to some extent, they remain masters of the Sahara, as were their ancestors. In centuries past, Tuareg tribesmen were respected for their uncanny skill in guiding caravans through the puzzling desert and maintaining cattle and camel herds in the harsh terrain. Today, the camel herding tradition of the Tuareg is disappearing. The fourth Berber group is the Muzab, or the Mozabites. These people traditionally have occupied the northern fringe of the Sahara Desert, relying on the oases found there for water. 
Like the Tuareg, the Mazab once were noted guides and traders in the Sahara. In recent generations, they have turned to other livelihoods. Some Mazab have even relocated to the northern cities. Since independence, some Algerian educators and artists have focused on renewing the ancient Berber traditions. All but a tiny fraction of Berbers are Muslims today, and yet most still maintain a few religious and social practices that are native to the Maghreb and older than Islam. They honor certain native saints, for example. And women in Berber communities are somewhat less restricted than are Muslim women in other societies. The Tuareg are particularly interesting in this regard. In sharp contrast to other Muslim societies, the blue people are matriarchal. In addition, while the women go unveiled, the men cover their faces with the tail end of their turbans. It is believed that evil spirits enter the body through the mouth and nose, so the men cover their faces to keep them out. Women, however, are believed to be immune to evil spirits because they possess the power of life. Instead, the women wear a headdress. When the weather is harsh, they drape a length of fabric from their headdresses over the headdress to create a cool tent over their heads. One of the ancient traditions of the blue people is a dance called the Gedra. The dance is performed at night around a fire. During the Gedra, the dancer veils herself in the same way that she would to protect from sun and sand, enveloping herself in darkness. During the dance, she will reach and scratch at the darkness, looking for a way to escape. The dance symbolizes the human search for enlightenment. When she is ready, the dancer will fling the veil aside and cast blessings on all the observers. The movements of her hands indicate whom her blessings are for, and whether they are for the past, present, or future. The speed and intensity of the gudra increase over time, and the dance can last until the dancer collapses in a trance. Of all the dances performed by the blue people, the Gedra is the most important. The Tuareg believe it connects them directly with the spiritual world and protects them from the dangers of their harsh environment. Daily Life and Society Most Algerians have Arab ancestry and inhabit the cities and towns of the nation's coastal zone. Since independence, Algerian leaders have promoted a general Arabization of the country. They have made Arabic the official language and affirmed the values and teachings of Islam. To a great extent, this seems to be a reaction against 130 years of French domination. As in older Arab countries, firm family structures are important in Algeria. Family loyalty runs deep, and younger Algerians exhibit respect for their elders. Also, as in other Arab countries, Algerian women gradually are emerging into a freer lifestyle than in times past, although they are still generally regarded as inferior to men. During the Long War for Independence, some women were engaged in active combat. Afterward, more and more women obtained jobs and enrolled in colleges. Both men and women 18 and older are entitled to vote in Algeria. Still, Muslim traditions remain firm. Most Algerian women veil their faces in public according to Islamic custom, and Algerian women are still required to have male guardians. The people of Algeria have followed a variety of religious religions throughout history. In early times, some of the Berbers embraced Carthaginian and later Roman gods. After the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century CE, Christianity spread widely across North Africa. Then came the Muslims from the East. Today, Islam is the official state religion, and almost all Algerians are of Malachite sect of Sunni Muslims. Recently, those who follow strict Muslim teachings have increased their influence in the country. A small fraction of the population are Christians, an even smaller fraction are Jews. Nine years of schooling are required for Algerian children. Education is provided free up through the technical school and university levels. At the time of independence in 1962, fewer than 10 in 100 Algerians could read and write. Today, the literacy rate has risen to about 70%. Literacy is higher among men than among women. Algerians also enjoy better health conditions than the inhabitants of most African countries. 
health care for the most part is provided free by the government through a national system of health clinics and hospitals. The average life expectancy, about 74 years, is longer today than it was at Independence five decades ago. The AIDS virus, which has devastated other parts of Africa, is not a major problem in Algeria. The rate of infant deaths has dropped dramatically, from about 15% in 1965 to less than 3% today. Serious health concerns in Algeria include lung illnesses such as tuberculosis and pneumonia, stomach disorders, and contagious diseases including cholera, scarlet fever, venereal diseases, and mumps. Literature and Music Algeria has produced a number of great writers and thinkers. Two of the most famous, Jacques Derrida and Albert Camus, were born in Algeria as the sons of French colonists. Derrida was a philosopher and critic who is best known for his complex theories known as deconstruction. This is essentially a method scholars use to read texts in order to understand the meanings and assumptions behind the written words. Camus was a highly influential author of whose works included The Stranger, an essay outlining his view of the absurdity of life called The Myth of Sisyphus, The Plague, and The Fall. He received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1957. One of the most famous Algerian authors was Mohamed Dib, who wrote more than 30 novels. During the Algerian War for Independence, Dib was expelled from the country by French authorities. Many of his later works are set during this period. Dib also published many poems, short stories, and books for children. Marie-Louise Taoussa Rouche, a woman of Berber ethnicity, is distinguished as the first important female Algerian writer, as well as a Berber activist. Her first novel, the autobiographical Jessence Noir, was published in 1947. In 1966, she helped found the Académie Berber, an organization of Berber artists, writers, and intellectuals. Her older brother, Jean Elmouhoub Amroche, is considered one of Algeria's greatest poets. The most famous living Algerian writer is Fatima Zora Imalayan, who writes in French using the pen name Asia Jabbar. A strong feminist, most of Jabbar's novels and stories focus on the difficulties faced by women in North African societies. Her novel, Fantasia, an Algerian cavalcade, was the first in a series of four novels about women living in the Maghreb. The others include A Sister to Scheherazade, Vast is the Prison, and The White of Algeria. In 1996, she won the Neustadt Prize for Contributions to World Literature, and in recent years she has been nominated several times for the Nobel Prize. Jabbar is generally considered one of North Africa's greatest writers. Music is also important to the people of Algeria. Rai music is a particular art form developed in western Algeria and brought to the cities by migrants. Rai means the path or the way. It can be interpreted as an opinion that is considered wise and true. The old wise men in Algerian culture used to pass on their teachings in the form of poetry. Like many oral traditions, the poems are long and consist not only of sage advice, but a historical record woven with religious implications. Modern Rai music is rebel music. Like rap in the United States, modern Rai uses heavily suggestive imagery in order to disturb the conservative establishment. The actual music is easy to dance to, barring from pop, rock, jazz, and funk. Musicians use any instruments they can acquire in their performances and blend traditional Arabic sounds with Western influences. Cities and communities. Look at this coastline. Gorgeous. In ages past, Algerian farmers and herders lived in far-flung villages across the coastal zone, in the mountains and around desert oases. During the French colonial period, administrators created dozens of villages throughout the northern part of the country. Then the long war for independence drastically altered the map of Algeria again. Almost 8,000 communities and villages were destroyed or abandoned. As many as 3 million rural people took refuge in larger towns and cities or were placed in resettlement communities. Some of the resettlement locations eventually became new towns. 
During the 1970s, the Algerian government created several hundred new villages as part of a plan to redistribute the population. Additionally, as in other countries where agriculture is dwindling, rural people have been abandoning their farms, herds, and age-old way of living to seek better conditions in urban areas. Some of Algeria's seaports and cities date to ancient times, yet if the typical foreigner is asked to name a city in Algeria, it's likely only one will come to mind. Algiers is not just the nation's capital, it is one of the most famous cities in the Mediterranean. Algiers Founded by the Phoenicians, Algiers now covers some 10 miles of hilly coastline along the Bay of Algiers. It lies about midway between the country's eastern and western borders. The name Algiers means island in Arabic. In past centuries, the bay indeed contained tiny islands, but most of them have since been leveled or become part of the mainland. The Carthaginians, and the Romans who fought them, called this important seaport Icosium. Marauding vandals from Europe in the 5th century CE arrived in the North African coast and sacked Icosium. Some 500 years later, Arab Berber inhabitants made it one of the most powerful centers of trade in the Mediterranean. Later, Algiers came under the control of the Turks, then the French. The population of Algiers and its suburbs number some 17 million, roughly half the country's total population. The city grew at an astonishing rate during the mid-20th century, even during the guerrilla warfare leading up to independence. In that period, foreign oil industry workers and French soldiers joined refugees from tribal mountain villages on the streets. Since then, the city has grown steadily. Algiers has long been a busy international port. During the mid-20th century, its harbor became a scene of constant activity. Huge ships brought in tons of building materials, steel, cement, wood, and coal for fuel. Then they filled their holds with Algeria's export commodities, mainly farm produce. Oran The city of Oran is a major port and commercial center, located on the Mediterranean coast of northwestern Algeria. Oran was founded in the 10th century by Moorish traders. Today it is the capital of the Oran Velaya, with a population of about 700,000. At the time Algeria became independent, Many Europeans lived in Oran. However, in July 1962, Algerian nationalists massacred some 3,000 unarmed Europeans living in the city. Most of the Europeans in Oran, more than 200,000 people, soon left the country. It took years for Oran to recover. The great writer Albert Camus was born in Oran and used the city as a setting for two of his greatest novels, The Plague and The Stranger. French fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent was also born in Oran, as were the influential Rai musicians Sheb Khaled and Rashid Taha. Sidi Belabes Inland Algerian cities and towns have grown and developed for different reasons. Sidi Belabes in northwestern Algeria originally was a French foreign legion post built by legionnaires in 1847. Until independence, more than a century later, it continued to be a principal training center for the military. Sidi Balabis is now home to an estimated 200,000 people. It is located near the seasonal river of Wadi Makara, and local industry includes agriculture and farm machinery manufacturing. Gardaya Gardaya is located in the Mazab Valley, which is listed by the UN as a World Heritage Site. There are five cities in the valley inhabited by the Mozabites. The people are considered Islamic Puritans and maintain stark houses and strict dress. Gardaya has hotels and restaurants to serve tourists, while the smaller towns do not allow outsiders to stay the night. Mozabite towns exhibit advanced urban planning. Each was split into a kasar, a winter town, wahat, summer town, and cemetery in the desert. Winter towns such as Gardaya have a mosque, a Friday mosque, a residential area, an open market, and fortifications. The houses center around a shaded courtyard and provide rooftop terraces to enjoy the open air. Tlimkin 
Tlemkin is the capital of the province of northwestern Algeria with the same name. It is home to 180,000 people. The city, which was once the center of a Berber empire, was captured by the Ottomans in 1553. The cool mountain climate has made Tlemkin a popular tourist destination for centuries. I really hope I'm saying that right. Tlemcen, maybe? Tlemcen? Tlemcen? Anyway. Tlemkin is home to olive plantations and vineyards and is also known for textiles and crafts. One of the major sites to visit is the tomb of Sidi Boumediene, a religious leader who lived there. The tomb of Algeria's second president, Houari Boumediene, is also located in Tlemkin. Constantine. At the eastern end of the Tell, the city of Constantine became prominent in Phoenician times, because of its natural fortress location atop a rugged plateau. It originally was known as Sirta, based on the word for city in Phoenician. The walls constructed by the Romans still stand, and the city is so well protected that the Vandals failed to capture it when they overran the region during the 5th century. French forces in the 1830s captured it only after two bloody attempts, taking disastrous losses in doing so. During World War II, Constantine served as a base of command for Allied forces in northern Africa. Constantine is one of the country's most interesting cities. Its history of more than 2,000 years is preserved in its architecture. Elements of Roman, Islamic, 19th century French, and modern designs are plainly seen. Temenrasset South of the Tell Zone, most of the few inhabitants live around oases. The only sizable town is Tamanrasset, located in the Ahakar Highlands of the southeast near Mount Tahat. To the south is the Sahara Desert. Tamanrasset is the chief city of the Tuareg. And that's the end of our book. Thank you so much for watching. This was a long one, but a really tingly one, I think. Really relaxing. I'm really sleepy. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good